All right, then. If you have any Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28. Uh, we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Matthew chapter number 28, uh, beginning in the first verse. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became his dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, fear not ye, for I know ye seek Jesus whom was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray tonight that we would never uh, be tired of hearing it, Lord, that we would uh, be, always be excited and glad to hear your word. Lord, we pray that the truth that is contained in these verses would never be far from us. Lord, help us to know and understand without the resurrection there is no hope. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, sometimes I think we look on them a little bit too lightly, but herein hinges on everything that our faith is about. Because if there had been no resurrection, <clears throat> our uh, religion, using that word loosely, what we would believe would be no better than anything else anyone else believes if they were Buddhist or Muslim or whatever, if there was no resurrection, what we have would really be no different than them. Right. But a blessing it's been, it is, is that we do have a resurrected Savior. On, on that one truth hinges everything that our people are about, and without that there would be uh, no hope whatsoever. In the first verse, Matthew records in the beginning excuse me, in the end of the Sabbath. Now, we've looked at that many, many different times and how that the week of the Passover was a whole week of Sabbaths, and then the uh, high Sabbath was on the very end of it, and now they're beginning a new week. That last Saturday, true Sabbath is over, and they're beginning a brand new week on Sunday. The week had about... Before them, all Sabbaths were gone, and now they had time to finish what uh, 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 Zach, uh, what the two uh, began earlier in, in burying the Lord Jesus Christ. They had to do a rush job on it. They didn't have all the things that were needed, and the women knew the oils and the and the spices that needed to be completed on the quick job that was done on his burial. Now, uh, they were anxious to get it done and, and get to the tomb. So as soon as the sun was up, that Sabbath was over so they could go and, and do the job uh, as it should have been properly done. Now, it says at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, now, a lot of people today, you're seeing more and more of this going back to the old seventh-day religions, uh, worshiping on Saturday. And I'm not talking about just uh, off-brand people. I'm talking Baptists who call themselves Seventh-day Baptists. They're not. The seventh day, the Sabbath, is for the Lord, is for the Lord God, Jehovah, the first, the newness of, of the New Testament is on the first day of the week. And a lot of people are letting that go, but it's very important. We need to know why we meet on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day and the Sabbath are two distinct things. They are very different from one another. And so it's very, uh, it's very needful we understand that this was really the ending of the Sabbath and beginning of the Lord's Day, the very first one that they would enjoy. 
In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to wander toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene. Now, we see uh, Mary Magdalene uh, mentioned time and time and time again, and she is one, the one, I think she's noted in uh, the early part of the Gospel of, Ma of Matthew, and again in Luke, of whom the Lord had cast out seven devils. Uh, demonically possessed woman, uh, now serving the Lord, wanting to do what most would not want to do, and that is to deal with a body that had been dead for three days by this time. Yeah. Now, uh, don't know, I've, I've seen my share of dead bodies, but listen, uh, by the third day, they're getting pretty rough, getting pretty difficult. Uh, this time of the year in uh, uh, Jerusalem, in Israel, probably wasn't as bad as it could have been. It's dry there, it's, it was cool that time of year. But still, the average person don't want to deal with a body that'd been rotted for three days. And so they were up against that, but we find this woman, Mary Magdalene, whom the Lord had saved miraculously, give her a new life, that she was anxious to do it. And I think that's about the best measure of your serving the Lord. How anxious are you to do it? What is your motivation? Uh, what keeps you captivated? What, what begs your interest? And obviously Mary Magdalene had to have a great love for the Lord Jesus Christ to be willing to do this. And so she was there, and the other Mary, and I don't, <laughs> there are several Marys this could be. I do not believe it was Mary, the mother of Christ. Uh, I do not believe it was, uh, I do not believe it was uh, Mary, uh, the sister of uh, Lazarus and Martha. The, this is the fourth Mary that you hear about. And we don't know a whole lot about her, but we know she was anxious to be helping in this process. Now, as you think of a rotted body on day three, that's about how distasteful the, the world looks at what we're doing. Uh, Christianity is no longer popular. Uh, the, word will, the world will try to sell you that bill of goods. It's not. If you stand for the truth, in fact, uh, the Bible says you will be hated for my name's sake. And, and that's kind of where we are in, in the modern day. And here we find these two women so captivated by what Christ did for them that they are willing to go and, and face a pretty dreadful situation just because they loved him. You know, this is what I have found. Whatever you love is what you're going to is what you're going to go after. If you love Christ, you'll seek Him with everything that you have. If you don't, you won't. If if you uh, if you love the world, you know what you're going to do. Deep down in your heart, you're going to go for the world with everything that you have. And so your love is directive. And these women loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were going after it. Now. Uh, they was going to see the sepulcher. Now, just as an aside, many times we have to kind of scope out our problems. Now, it and I, this gospel doesn't get into it uh, as much as Luke's gospel, but Luke's gospel says very plainly, who will move the stone for us? Uh, they, they were concerned about that. But here we find it says they were just going to see the stone, maybe size it, size it up, say, I don't know, it's going to take six or seven men to get this thing uh, to move in, just to see it. Just to see, you know, what I have found with God's people, a lot of the times the problems we think are so big, numbers in the church or, or opposition to missions, the problem is not nearly as bad once you just look at it. So they had a willingness just to go, uh, let's go and see how big this is. Now, I also not want you to notice it's not without threats because what is sitting, they already know, is sitting at the tomb. Four quanturians of soldiers, right? 16, 16 armed men at the foot of the tomb. And so you think about yourself and, and what you would do and, and where your hope lies this evening. Would you, willing to, would you be willing to risk that two women against 16 armed Roman soldiers? That's what they were going for. That's what they were going up against. And uh, 
they, uh, they were willing to go anyway. Now, there's rich rewards when you follow him. Verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Now, I think that's an un unusual, interesting wording. It says the earthquake was the result of the angel coming, not the other way around. In other words, uh, the angel came and did his work, and the earth responded by shaking itself. You know, a lot of people will say, well, the tomb was opened by earthquake. That is not what the scripture says. It's opened by an angel, and the angel's presence caused the earthquake. Uh, and you know, angels are not even really uh, holy beings. They're, they're, they're just created things to worship God. Now, if something like that can cause the earth to move, think about when God's people really got focused on something, really meant business with God. And we find that uh, we don't find that a lot in the modern day where people are focused enough to see this. And so we find that they're, they're there and the Lord's angel comes down and it says he was setting, uh, uh, that he rolled back, the end of verse 2, rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Uh, also says, uh, uh, can, you, can you imagine going down there and again, in the back of your mind, we're like, how are we going to move this rock? And you get there and there's an angel sitting on the rock and the doors, the rock that had closed the door. And now there's an angel sitting. Have you ever even tried to comprehend what it would be to see an angel? Now, I, on, the, on the scriptural side of that, I know we've all seen them. Because the Bible says you've entertained angels unaware. Now, we're not going to get the, the Catholic two-winged being with flowing hair. That's not going to be the angel you get. It'll probably be the guy that asks you for a cold cup of water and keeps walking down 120 somewhere. That'll probably be the one you get. But at any rate, we find that the manifestation of this one is very much huh, like you might imagine an angel to be. White flowing garment, so bright that light is shining out of him. And he's standing there and the, the grave's behind him and the stone is there and he's sitting on top of the stone. And... To me, that just took my mind away. I, I don't think I could have finished my mission, so to speak. I don't think I could have went in there because the whole reason there was what? To finish the burial process, to finish draping, to put the aloes and the myrrh in there, to get the job completed. I think I would have completely forgot about that in the presence of this angel. You know, uh, also, it had to be a great, great encouragement to them. Uh, sometimes we just need that uh, validation. Yeah, you're, you're doing right. <laughs> the, re the reality is there. He was exactly who he said he was. We need that from time to time, don't we? I think that's what really fellowship is all about. It, it, it's not to put marks on a board somewhere, but it's that we can be there for each other and say, yes, this really is truly how it is. And so we find that they approach the tomb and find something totally different than they, and that they anticipated. And that's much of the Christian walk is that we find something totally different than what we thought we were going to start with. Verse 3, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, that's that 16 Roman guards, the keepers did shake and become like dead men. Now, uh, you know, and, and that's what you find many times uh, when the presence of holiness comes down, worldly men just fall out of the way. They're, 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 they cannot connect. They're not they're not involved anymore. And that's exactly what happens here. Uh, the, the, the angel came down and the men just passed out. And, and you know, uh, later, Caiaphas would pay them, so you tell everybody that you fell asleep on the job and they come and stole his body by night and, and, and we'll let you off the hook if you just tell them that. But I want you to see, it was the presence of God that knocked them down. You know, you 
holiness people, and I use that word very loosely, they think they're slain in spirit. Well, it looks like to me here from this, it was the lost people that were laying down, not the saved. Right? And, and, and so we find that God always, the Lord God always takes care of the problem. And so now they have an open view, a direct, uh, a direct light, a direct, uh, a direct pathway to get into the tomb, although they don't. Verse number four, uh, five, excuse me. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Now, I want you to see the uh, the first reaction I would have, and, and I don't think that angels understand us that well. They're usually just message bearers, and that's this one's job again. We never uh, see this angel identified in any way as, uh, as Ma Michael or any of the angels we know about. But he came with a simple message. He's alive. And then he, 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 he'll say in a minute, go tell his disciples. Mm -hmm. And uh, then and when they come back, uh, I think it's uh, Peter or Andrew that looks down in there and see is the angel still there? And uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to me that they were, they were the first individuals to be able to see what was, uh, what was going on in there. Was able to see inside the tomb. And so, in verse number 6, the Bible says, He is not here, for He is risen, as He said. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to remember that all along this time, uh, all through the Lord Jesus Christ ministry, time and time again, he says, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. Remember ye these words. And he would say it again and again and again, even to the point that they, they had forgotten. And when they come to him, the women's going to come and say, the Lord is risen. And it says that their tales seem like idle tales. Yeah. You know what? Sometimes the second return of Christ seems nothing more to me than an idle tale. Now, if I'm like that, I know you have to be too. I'm not the only one that gets discouraged. I'm not the only one that gets down. I'm not the only one that gets tired. I'm not the only one that uh, feels like I can barely hang on sometimes. All of us go through that. And it, it, it's almost a sense of comfort to know the apostles did too. Right. Listen, but the, the sweet thing of that tonight is it's not an idle tale. He is coming. Just as surely as they're going to fix him to meet with him and have supper with him and discuss the uh, ascension back to glory, just as surely as that happened, he's coming again. Right. Uh, you know, I fully believe this in the, in the modern day and all these people who try to make predictions when Christ is coming. You know why that really happens? So we'll believe it less. When they're wrong, and another, another time passes all the way back to Charles Taz Russell, no. first Russellite, uh, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses, they're Russellites. He started making those foolish predictions in 1880, and they didn't happen, and it, it carried on into the First World War. He died just before the beginning of the First World War, and it kept going and kept on. All, and ever since it's all kinds of crazy people. Oh, he's coming December the 6th at 831. All that does is make people doubt the scripture. He, the devil's sly. He's, he's very good at what he does. You know when Jesus is coming? I have no idea. That, that, that's the information that I can give you. But I do know this. <laughs> encouraged by the Spirit of God, He is coming. Mm -hmm. I don't know when. I don't know how long it'll be. I don't know if I'll be living or dead. But I do know this. The Lord Jesus Christ will return. And so these women are the first individuals to get to carry the full gospel, the resurrected Lord Jesus. They're the first ones to carry this message anywhere. We're women. He is not here. 
for he is risen, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him. Lo, I told you, he had finished his message. He had completed his purpose. He had done the job that was given him. He was an angel. He was designed, assigned to do it, and he got it done. Verse 8, and they departed quickly from the sepulcher. Now, I want you to notice an uh, unusual thing here. It shouldn't be unusual, but if we don't pay attention, often uh, we, uh, we get the idea that, um, that Andrew, no, excuse me, that uh, John and Peter saw him first. But he invites the women, come and see the place where the Lord lay. And then it's recorded, and as they departed from the sepulcher. So for them to depart from the sepulcher, what had to be? They had to be in the sepulcher to get out of the sepulcher and depart from it, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't Peter and John that first saw the, the empty place. It was those women. It, it, it was those ladies, the sisters of the church. They saw the very first to behold the empty tomb. And if that's, if that's not true, we might as well have the current cut off and go to the house. Because if this, this is not true, nothing else is either. This is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we believe hinges on this. And so we know, without a doubt, that it's exactly what happened. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run and bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and worshipped him, and, 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 hit, look, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Now, as they're on their way back, they meet Jesus themselves. And, and, and they worship, and uh, they give God the praise, and they're still fulfilling. They, want, they were directed by the angel to go and tell the church what had happened. They were on their way. They have this uh, experience with Christ on the, on the road back to town, and they get to see him and feel him and know who he is. And then when they get to the church of that day, that's when huh, things get discouraging. Verse 10. Then said Jesus unto them, meaning the women that he had just uh, interacted with, be not afraid to tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. And when they were and when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and shoot unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And they and when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave a large money unto the soldiers, say, saying, Say ye. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if and if this come to the governor's ear, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. When the 11 disciples came into Galilee, now I want you to see they did exactly what they were told to do, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Now, I want you to see they knew about this mountain from the ministry of Christ. Uh, he said, tell them to go to the place that I appointed. Have you ever thought about Ever been in a sermon? Ever been in a situation? Or maybe even outside the church? Like, you know, just say, now Donna, you meet me. Or she says, Larry, you meet me at mom and dad's house. And then I'm on my way. I'm like, now where did she say to meet her? You got to be paying attention, do you not? Every day, every situation, every sermon, every Sunday school lesson, every time we meet, you have to be paying attention. And, and so, however they had come up with this in Jesus' ministry, they, uh, 
they all made it to the mountain where the Lord would be, asc be ascended. Verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Now, in my own Bible, I have that written down because it, it is resounded with me many, many times is that that portion of man that is prone to doubt, prone to say, really? Prone to say, I'm not sure about that. You know, what we need to do is just believe this for what it says. I don't need commentaries. I need the Bible. I don't need recorded messages from preachers gone by. What I need is the Bible. I don't. I, I don't need. Uh, uh, I. I don't even need. All I need is this. You know, and, and nothing wrong with organized schools. I don't have much of an issue with that. But uh, you know, when it comes down to it, the, who, do, who does the Bible say that is the teacher of this? The Holy Spirit, right? That is our teacher, right? Yeah. So why do we need theological stuff like that? And people, you know, they're, they're, they're really uh, getting to the point they're very, very hung up on that and, in fact, will almost be oppositional about it. So we find then that he, huh, that some of them, even on the Mount of Ascension, still doubt. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All, every bit of it, everything, every authority, all power, not only the power of might, but the power of authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So everything now is in the ownership of Christ. Then he gives some of it out. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Here we find some, not all of it, some of the authority going to the church. Right. Uh, and these, these, this is what we're given to do. Teach all nations. This is something that when I was a boy, Bella's age, I couldn't even comprehend how that would ever happen. Now we can. Bella has my phone somewhere, but I talk to people all the time, our brethren in New Mexico. I talk to them in English, they speak back to me in Spanish, and my device lets me know what they're saying to me in English. That, that wasn't even imaginable 40 years ago. I, I mean, it, it, it didn't even enter anyone's mind. And now sermons I preached 10 years ago can be uploaded into any language that wants it. See, that, that is being fulfilled in my lifetime. So we're, we're, we're to continue to do that. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, uh, we won't go too deeply in that. That's not the purpose of the message tonight. But again, I always want you all to be studying some for yourself in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, I've not always seen it done that way. Usually most people say in the name of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Ghost kind of weirds them out. Yeah. But I think we ought to go with what the Scripture says, don't you? And then in another area of the New Testament, you find in the name of Jesus only. Literally, that's what it says. I think both are accurate. Uh, there'd be some that would disagree with me on that, but if you throw that part of Acts out, in my mind, you have to throw the rest of it out with it, right? And, and so we see that we are to baptize them once they, uh, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, I want you to see the promise that he gives us there. Uh, I'm with you always. Uh, when things are turned up on its side, he's with us. When things uh, don't uh, look too good, he's with us. He's an ever, ever enduring friend. And uh, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. Ask yourself how many, how many people, 
How excited would you be if you were the one to find that? Well, uh, believe it or not, you did. When he saved your soul, you saw the empty tomb for the first time for really what it is. So why shouldn't we be equally excited and, and telling people uh, of his goodness and his grace and, and how, how wonderful a Savior we serve? That, that should be our daily practice.